get to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work going on uh, in control theory, and I think there's a huge overlap uh, with things going on broadly in computer science uh, and more specifically here at Popple. And so I'm looking forward to both uh, telling you about them and talking during breaks and the rest of the day and tomorrow uh, more about them. So um, what I wanted to uh, talk about today uh, is some ideas that I think have particular overlap and great synergy uh, in terms of control theory and computer science. But let me maybe start by saying a little bit about what control theory is, uh, because that's my background and that's sort of where I'm coming from, and so you should know uh, some of my biases. So the kind of traditional view of control theory uh, is this uh, picture where we have sensing computation and actuation in a feedback loop. Now, of course, this happens all over the place, embedded systems, all of these types of things. Um, and the uh, notion is that we'd like to design really the sensory system, the computational system, the algorithms that are running, and the actuation system, so that this closed loop feedback system, right, where the system does something, the controller reacts to it, that changes what the system does, and then the controller reacts to that, uh, and so we go around this feedback loop, has some set of desired properties. And the desired properties that we typically talk about in the field are these three, stability, performance, and robustness. So stability is just sort of the baseline property. This is like saying you don't want to have you know, deadlocks or liveocks or something. It's just the basic thing that you want. What we really design for, though, is performance and robustness. Right? So you have to have stability. But what we care about is that I've designed the dynamics of this closed loop system to have a desirable set of properties. I've described some set of behaviors uh, that are the behaviors that I want. Uh, if it's a cruise control system or an autonomous vehicle or something like that, I might like it to drive smoothly, to maintain speed within some certain amount, to stay away from cars by some distance, right? All of those sorts of things. And these are uh, often performance goals. How quickly do you come up to speed, right? How smooth is the ride, other types of things. Um, and of course, if the system that you're controlling is completely well known and never changes, this is relatively simple, right? You do it, you get it working in the lab, you deploy it, it always works exactly the same and you're done. Um, of course, in most systems, that's not the case, and so there's a huge amount of attention paid to robustness. How do we get the performance and stability when the underlying system is changing? Right? So if you're driving a brand new autonomous car, or you're controlling a brand new autonomous car with your computer, that's one thing versus a 10-year-old version, right, in which the actuators don't quite work the same and the, maybe the distribution of mass is a little bit different because people have added things to it, et cetera. Cameras are a little bit out of uh, kilter. So we'd like to get all of those uh, behaviors uh, and have them work even if the system isn't exactly what it's supposed to be. So the combination of stability, performance, and robustness is what control theory grew up doing in some sense. Um, and for the first 50 years or so of the field, so it's a field that's probably about 75 years old now, uh, that was really what it focused on, and very much at the level of continuous time systems. So control theory grew up uh, in the Cold War. It was what we used to make sure that missiles landed where they were supposed to land, right? So these were all continuous systems. And so the, the pictures that you see on the left are some of the pictures that the field sort of identifies. Uh, the watt governor, right, that regulates steam engines, the thermostat that controls the temperature in this room, uh, various aircraft uh, types of examples, uh, including very aggressive aircraft uh, like the one on the lower left. But over the last decade or two, uh, the kind of ideas and principles of control have been expanding as we think about more interesting and complicated systems that look more like what we see in the world today. And so autonomous vehicles, uh, control of the cell, uh, control of large-scale uh, network systems, still military systems. The figure on the lower right uh, is, a, as you can see, the little flames down there and other things, uh, is a DOD picture uh, about controlling a battle space. So these systems are still systems in which we have sensing, actuation and computation connected in some sort of a feedback loop, but they're much more complex systems. And I think now the field views itself uh, as a field in which we provide the collection of tools and techniques for analyzing, designing, and implementing these complex systems, right? Along with many other disciplines, right? We're one of the disciplines that thinks about uh, how to do that right. And I think the things that maybe distinguish control theory a little bit is that we really think about the combination of dynamics, interconnection, communications, computing, and software. Right? And the dynamics uh, matter, and the interconnection matters, and again, stability, performance, and robustness sitting on top of all of that. So the perspective that we take is, you know, how do we interconnect and, and build these extremely complex systems uh, in a way that gives robust performance against some specification of desired behaviors? And I'd say there are two key principles that sort of underlie all of control theory, whether it's being applied in the kind of traditional sense, the more modern sense, uh, or, you know, a variety of different disciplines. Uh, and that is, the first is that feedback provides a tool for managing uncertainty. It allows us to 
handle uncertainty, either in the system or in the environment. If you're designing an autonomous car, we don't know exactly what the environment's going to do. We need robust behavior. I'm not going to crash. I'm going to get to my destination, independent of what the environment does, subject to some assumptions, right? Um, same thing. If I don't know the system exactly, I still want to get performance out of it. So feedback is a way to do that. If you don't know exactly what's happening, you can measure what's happening, see if that's what you expect to be happening, and if not, you can correct on it, right? And so feedback provides a tool for managing that type of uncertainty. The second thing that feedback is used for is to design the dynamics of the system. So if we have a set of behaviors that we'd like, and that's not the natural set of behaviors of a system, feedback is a way to get the behaviors of the system to match our desires. Uh, and so, for example, if you've got an aircraft, the, the natural dynamics of the aircraft may not have uh, the performance characteristics that you like, maybe it doesn't land quite as smoothly, et cetera, so we use feedback to get those characteristics, right? So it becomes part of the way that we design the dynamics. So those two things, managing uncertainty and design of dynamics, are what all tools in control theory in some sense come down to. Um, and a corollary of that is that by designing the dynamics and managing the uncertainty, we can provide modularity. That is, I can take a module that is robust with respect to what it's interconnected to. It has a certain behavior, a certain function, right, that is, to some extent, independent of some of the changes that might occur on its interfaces. And so those three things, I think, underlie uh, what's going on in control theory. Now, as I said, control theory started out really thinking about continuous systems, the control of these continuous systems, uh, and very much design of feedback laws that sat down in the deep uh, depths uh, of whatever the system was. But there have been some trends that have changed uh, what we've been doing, uh, and I think, again, bring us more into overlap uh, with areas in computer science. And so here's a couple of those trends. Um, so one, which is probably the earliest one, which now, you know, 20 years ago started to become mainstream, uh, is just the role of optimization. Uh, and so the fact that we can do lots of computation uh, and that that computation allows us uh, to uh, do real-time updates. So what you're looking at here is a, a vectored thrust flight control system from my lab about 20 years ago in which the way we're doing the computation here is we're actually computing what to do for the next 10 seconds, implementing it for about 100 milliseconds, and then recomputing what to do next. Right? And so this technique called receding horizon control or model predictive control makes use of the fact that we can do fast computation online, right? and it allows us to implement desired behaviors in the face of uncertainty. Uh, and so our use of the knowledge of what the dynamics and constraints on the system are enable this, and of course uh, it wouldn't happen without uh, in the increased ability to do online computation. Another one, just as, as in every uh, aspect of uh, modern life, that's affected is just layering architectures and network control systems. So if you go to a controls conference now, you'll see many, many, many sessions on network control systems. What happens when we start looking at not a single system, but thousands of systems that are interconnected, whether that's in a factory, or looking at uh, server farms, or looking at uh, advertising and how much you cost things out uh, in presenting uh, someone with a price? Et cetera, et cetera. And so Internet of Things uh, arises, of course, in a natural way there. A third one, and the one that I'll probably spend most of my time today talking about, of course, is just the role of formal methods. Um, and I think formal methods in control and in robotics in some sense is something that uh, I'd say the field wasn't paying much attention to until about a decade ago, and then a couple of early leaders sort of said, man, this is a powerful set of tools that fits within the kind of context of what we need uh, to be using in control theory. So I'll say more about that. And, and the, the, I think the big trend is just how do we go from thinking about control of components to thinking about control of systems to control of thinking about, uh, to thinking about control of the entire enterprise, an entire uh, suite of systems all operating at once. So what I'd like to talk about today then is say a little bit more about modern design of control systems. How do we design control systems? What are some of the ideas there? Uh, and then I'll talk about the role of formal methods uh, in that context. And then talk a little bit about some of the emerging areas uh, and things that I think uh, hopefully together uh, we can do. Okay, so I'll give you a, a, an example of the sort of thing uh, that motivated us to start thinking about things differently, and this came from the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, so this is a picture of Alice. Uh, this is an autonomous vehicle that was built by a bunch of Caltech undergraduates. Uh, this is, I think, the second incarnation of Alice that you're looking at. Um, so this was from the Desert Challenge, for those of you who followed the DARPA Grand Challenge. And this is a big control system, right? It senses things about its environment, it makes decisions, it actuates those, right? Uh, it does all of that. And uh, this particular uh, vehicle uh, was one that uh, brought together about uh, 75 students over about 18 months to put together a complex system and get it to work, um, and had you know, the reasonably complicated software for an undergraduate project, a couple of hundred thousand lines of code sitting on top of millions of lines of open source code. Uh, and it did the sorts of things that uh, one would hope 
uh, of an autonomous vehicle. It can come up to intersections. It can reason about uh, what's there. Uh, it can decide, okay, is it my turn to go or not? Not yet. Okay, now once this car goes, it's my turn. I can go. Uh, and so I go. It doesn't know exactly where the roads are, right? So it has uncertainty in the specifics of the roads. Uh, it can handle actuator failures or degradation. So if the steering wheel starts to get blocked up a little bit, you can see its performance isn't necessarily great, right? It wobbles around a little bit. Uh, and of course, these things now in, in cars, that, in autonomous cars that are moving lots of people are much better. Here, it's waiting until the car in front of it goes. The distance is dictated by DARPA. Uh, it comes up to the stop line, right? It waits. It sees that that car is there. Uh, and now once that car goes, it says, good, my turn to go. All right. So this is an example of a feedback control system. And what's interesting about it is it's not just a continuous system, right? There are lots of discrete decisions in there. Do I go? Do I stop? Right? You know, uh, if I get in the middle of an intersection and somebody else starts going, what do I do? All right? uh, so how do I deal with these systems? So here's a kind of high-level block diagram for what that looks like in terms of the architecture we implemented. Uh, and so it's got a bunch of sensing systems on the left. It goes through some sort of world map uh, that represents the world around it. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is a controller stack where we would really do optimization-based sort of receding horizon, right? Here's what I think the world around me looks like. Here's what I want to do for the next 10 seconds. Do that for a second or so. Recompute, right? And then do that over and over and over again. And as I move through the environment, the kind of gray arrow coming down around the bottom is the big feedback loop. There are all sorts of internal feedback loops. Am I staying in the center of the lane and other things, right? But there's a big feedback loop, and then I'm interacting with the traffic around me, and it's deciding what to do, right? And then uh, we have that interaction again. So this is an example of a networked hybrid system. The network here is not between the vehicles, but within the vehicle. So we had about uh, maybe 25 cores that were running, hundreds of threads, right? All of these are interconnected to each other, running relatively independently. And I think the question is, how do we design systems of this complexity, and how do we make sure that they function as desired? So, Getting the system to work in a demo versus getting it to work in the real world is what we've spent the last 10 years doing in autonomous vehicles research. Uh, and not all of it is applying tools from control theory, but the principles of control, right, management of uncertainty, design of dynamics, are sort of sitting there at fit. Uh, and I think there are places that we have tools and there are places that we don't have tools. And of course, as a researcher, it's the places that we don't have tools that we're interested in. All right, so how might we think about that uh, system design? Um, so one way to think about it is to look a little bit at, at the problem we're trying to solve and then look at what the levels of abstraction are uh, that we might use to do that. So here's a description or one way of describing what the problem is. So we have a set of continuous dynamics represented here as a, as a differential equation that guide the way that the vehicle moves in its environment. Uh, and so X is some set of continuous states, position and orientation of the vehicle, uh, and speed, for example. Uh, U is some continuous inputs, the steering wheel torques and other things that we can apply, the, the pressure we apply on the brake, et cetera. Um, D is some set of external disturbances, right? Wind, if it's an airplane, things like wind, if it's a hill, right, th that affects the speed and other things. So we have some external disturbances that are coming in. Uh, and the subscript alpha represents discrete states in this setting. And so for a given discrete state, which actuators are working, what mode am I in, we might have a different set of dynamics. Now, the discrete states can evolve. They evolve not in continuous time, but in some sort of discrete event way. Uh, and so the discrete dynamics I've written here is a guarded transition system. So if a certain guard that can depend on the continuous and discrete state is true, uh, then that enables a transition uh, where the discrete state alpha can change according to some rule. So there's a guard and there's a rule. And so this is one representation, there are many others, of a hybrid system. And so this, I claim, can be used to describe an autonomous vehicle. And what we would like to do is both design the continuous control law and probably design some of, probably with a different set of discrete variables, the modes and the mo transitions between the mode. Am I in intersection mode? Am I in driving down the freeway mode? Uh, am I in a mode in which I'm in a parking lot? And those might change what the uh, desired behaviors are, what the specifications are. They might change what the dynamics are, depending on the particular system. And although I've sort of described it here in the context of an autonomous vehicle, certainly you can imagine that this applies to uh, the electric power system in an aircraft, for example, which is another system that we worry about, where the modes might be flight mode, takeoff mode, uh, some sort of failure mode, and engines gone down mode, things like that. So this is a fairly general class of systems. Now, What's the performance specification for the system? So there's a stability specification, right? Keep all of the states near their nominal values, don't get stuck in deadlocks and live locks and things like that. But a performance specification might be, for example, the two lines on the right, where we first have some sort of a continuous performance specification, written here as minimizing some integral cost plus a terminal cost over some horizon. This might be energy uh, or something like distance from the center of the lane. You'd like to you know, minimize the integral of the error between uh, where you'd like to be and where you are in the 
the center of the lane, uh, things of that sort. So think of this as the continuous part of a cost. And then, of course, some sort of uh, more discrete logical description of things, right? If you're in an intersection, then wait until other people come, right? I don't know how to write that down as an integral cost in an easy way. Uh, and so I'll write that as some sort of propositional logic or temporal logic formula of some sort. So now we'd like to say, how do I design the controller to do this? And of course, we don't, as with everything, design it in one shot, right? We break it up into levels of abstraction, and we solve at each layer of abstraction, right, a different control problem. And so if you're designing a system like this, the lowest layer of abstraction uh, is just designing the physical dynamics of the system. You have to build the car. Right? You have to decide how powerful an engine do I want, what type of motor do I want to put on the steering wheel, that you know, sort of tells me how fast I can turn or how fast I can brake and other things. So there is a design problem there that is pretty much directly at the continuous level in the way that we would think about it. Uh, and so here you're designing that set of differential equations by choice of components that you're going to put together. And the types of specifications you might have are the operating envelope, how fast can you go, how quickly can you stop, et cetera, the energy efficiency of the system, uh, maybe the amount of actuator authority uh, that you want to have. Can I, for example, power the steering wheel more powerfully than a human could hold it, all right? Might be something in an autonomous vehicle you might think about. So these are all parts of the specification. Now, once we have that physical system, then we can start thinking about doing the lowest layer of control. Uh, and this lowest layer of control uh, might be just a standard feedback controller like the traditional one that I showed you, uh, where I'm saying I want you to maintain the speed at a desired reference, I want you to stay in the middle of the lane, I want you to you know, push the accelerator and brake and move the steering wheel in ways that do that. And so our model of that system uh, might be written as an input-output model. Here I've written in Laplace transform domain or frequency domain, it's a continuous time model saying that the output y is a function of the inputs u through some linear process, so that p of s is the transfer function corresponding to the linear dynamics, um, and then the disturbances also enter in. And I will also have to specify the environment. I have to tell you something about the disturbances. So that norm that you see uh, in the uh, sort of second, uh, in the middle box under model uh, says that some weighted frequency description of the disturbances is given. So I know that the disturbances have some uh, uh, frequency domains. Like, can I get a constant disturbance? Can I get very high frequency disturbances? What are the disturbances? I have to describe the environment that I want to be robust with respect to. Right? And so that's that part. And then the specification is written here in a kind of control theoretic way uh, as the infinity norm of a weighted transfer function. What this really means is just make sure that the uh, maximum of this function over all, frequency, uh, uh, all frequencies is less than some bound. And at the low level of control theory, this is what we spent, you know, sort of 50 years doing, right, was figuring out how to solve this problem. And this is what's running in all aircraft flight control systems and cruise control systems and temperature control systems, right? You're solving this problem, right, because you're just trying to regulate something to a point. Now, in this system, right, we need to do more than that, right? It's not just hold a constant speed, right, but actually follow a trajectory or figure out what that trajectory is. And so the next layer of abstraction might be what we call the trajectory layer of abstraction. And so here we go back to the nonlinear differential equation, uh, x dot equals f of alpha xu, and I've dropped the d here just for simplicity. And we may have constraints. I can only go so fast. I need to stay away from certain parts of my state space that might be uh, harmful. And the specification for the problem that I might solve here is this one that I wrote above, right? So now I'm finally at this one where I say, okay, I want to minimize some cost function, right? I want to get from point A to point B in minimum time, but without using too much energy and some trade-off between all of those things. So at that trajectory level, we're still solving relatively continuous dynamics. The cost function, you see L has a subscript alpha. That might depend on the mode that we're in. We might use different cost functions, right, if we're driving down the freeway versus in a parking lot or other things. And then finally, at the highest level of abstraction in this particular description is the decision-making layer. And so here my model is going to be some sort of discrete transition system. What mode am I in, right? Uh, if I go, I go from a road to an intersection, from an intersection to a road, from a road to a parking lot, all of those sorts of things. And my specification might be some sort of temporal logic formula here written uh, as an LTL or actually an STL uh, that I'll tell you about in a second formula. And so I have to solve that problem. And so, of course, at each layer of abstraction, we have some assumptions about what's above and below, right? So we do the, you know, kind of usual thing, uh, and we make those assumptions, and we design at that layer, and then we want to make sure that the composition works. So this part, right, very familiar, is what we do in all of you know, large-scale systems, including computing systems. But what I'm particularly interested in and want to talk a little bit about here is how do we combine this logical layer, for which there are many, many tools in computer science, uh, with uh, this dynamical layer, sort of one layer down. So how do we make sure that uh, we are making decisions that are compatible with the dynamics of the system and do this in a feedback way? We want to manage uncertainty. We want to design the dynamics of this overall system. Okay, so 
Let me talk a little bit then about uh, this is sort of the problem that we want to solve. And, and I would say again that, you know, 95% of control problems break down into this hierarchy or can be broken down in this hierarchy. So it's a very generic problem that we want to solve. So let me say first a little bit about just how we're going to specify uh, the discrete behaviors and how we're going to couple that to the continuous dynamics and then some of the methods that we can use uh, for actually synthesizing controllers to do that. Okay, so we'll use temporal logic uh, to uh, describe our dynamics and in particular uh, linear temporal logic is sort of the starting point uh, for most of us in doing uh, that level of abstraction. And so we have the usual uh, temporal logic operators so we can talk about a sequence of events and we can ask whether or not in a given execution sequence is some property eventually true, is some property always true, uh, is something true at the next uh, time that the state changes. And of course uh, we need to combine all of those in the column over on the right uh, into the usual collection of things that are more useful. So for example, if we want progress properties, the third bullet down, we might say that always eventually something's true. Always eventually I'm back in my lane, always eventually I check my rear view mirror, always eventually my actuators are near their middle position, right, you know, whatever it is that I happen to want to say. Um, we may also have stability conditions, eventually always, so we may say that, you know, eventually I always want to be within one meter of the center line, right, and of course, really this will not hold forever, forever, and I'll say a little bit more in a second, uh, but over some bound. Uh, and then the other combinations of things, so implications and, and responses and things of that sort. So this is a very useful language. There are other languages that people in the discrete event systems community have used and people in the controls community have used. But I'd say increasingly we're finding that this particular language that computer science has given us uh, is a useful one. Um, we do use a, a variant of that that we find uh, handy, which is signal temporal logic. And signal temporal logic really just adds two things on top of this. Uh, one is the ability to reason over continuous functions. Uh, and so we can talk about uh, having some uh, function v that's less than some bound, uh, and that's a continuous function on the states, for example. Uh, and so maybe we want, uh, if V is a voltage on an electric power system or something, maybe we want that voltage to always remain below some threshold, or we want to, if it is not true, then do something so it would enter into our formulas. Um, we also want to have things that are bounded time regions. So we might say, for example, we want a property which is always true on a bound, uh, bounded region T1 to T2. Uh, so I might say that, you know, I want to come back into my lane and stay there for at least 15 seconds, right, before I deviate again or something along those lines. Uh, and same thing with response, we might want to respond within a certain time. That's a very important one in many of the real-time control systems we deal with. It's not just that if an event happens, then at some point in the future you should respond to it, but within 10 milliseconds you re should respond to it. So for example, one of the other application areas we work in uh, is electric power systems for aircraft. So you all used one of these if you flew here, uh, and if an engine went down, then within a very short period of time you want power to be resupplied to whatever that engine was powering, right, via some backup channel or something else, and so the specifications have to reflect. All right, so we'll use temporal logic, some flavor of temporal logic to describe those temporal properties. Um, we have the problem that we also have continuous dynamics, and so for the purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll kind of take the easy way out, which is to discretize those continuous dynamics, and so let me talk a little bit about that. So we need to, we have a continuous system, we have a specification that's given in some sort of uh, uh, discrete state representation. And so one thing that we can do is talk about converting our continuous system dynamics into a uh, discrete uh, representation. And so uh, that mechanism of abstraction is an important one. And so the way we're going to do that is uh, relatively straightforward. So we have some continuous state space X. There may be various regions shown here as different colors in that state space uh, in which uh, certain properties are true. Maybe one of those is a parking lot and one's a lane or something like that. So I, I'm going to break up ahead of time my state space into regions that I know are going to enter into my propositions, right? So I have some sort of uh, regions that are predefined. But now I have dynamics in these, and I have to worry about the fact that going from one region to another has to obey the underlying continuous dynamics of the system. I can't take my car and just slide sideways, right? I have to drive and turn, and so I have to take that into account. And so we need to break up our, our state space into a smaller state space and figure out the interconnection structure between that state space. And so we're simply going to uh, ask the question, if I start in some region of the state space, does there exist a continuous control that I can apply that will take me to a neighboring region of my state space. And the way that we want this to work is we'd like the semantics to be that from any point in one region, I can get to some point in the next region. 
Now, because we have disturbances in unmodeled dynamics, we almost immediately can end up with a non-deterministic transition system, right? Because I might tell you, right, to drive straight down the road, but if there's a huge wind blowing, I might get blown into the other lane, right? And so even though I commanded the system to go straight, I may not actually go straight. And so we'll get a non-deterministic transition system that tells us if you apply this command, here's where you might end up. You're not going to end up anywhere, right? You're not going to end up behind you, for example, probably, unless it's a really big wind. Um, so, uh, but you may not end up exactly where you want. So we'll get a non-deterministic transition system. Of course, we have to reason over that non-deterministic non transition system. Um, but one of the things that's nice is, and if you're interested, I'm happy to tell you the details, the tools from control theory allow us to actually create this discrete abstraction right, in a way in which it is a proper simulation relation, right? So that is that anything we see in the discrete abstraction, there exists a trajectory in the continuous system, and any trajectory in the continuous system, right, there exists a trajectory in the discrete abstraction. And that's, of course, the property that we care about. And it's that property that allows us to connect uh, the continuous dynamics, where I have this cost function that I'm trying to minimize, to the discrete dynamics, where I might have some temporal logic formula. So the supervisory controller is that discrete layer of decision making. So in the controls field, uh, often called supervisory control. And so uh, we might have at the supervisory control layer some sort of finite state machine that we synthesize uh, or that we design by hand uh, that tells us what modes we want to go into, change lanes, move into the intersection, et cetera. Uh, that then sends a command down to the continuous controller that should implement that action uh, and so drive the car there. And of course, at the top level, we know that might have been non-deterministic, right? and so we may not have ended up where we thought, but we have to reason over that. And so we get on the uh, far right-hand side, we get you know, this sort of uh, bisimulation relation between the continuous trajectories in the continuous space uh, and the discrete trajectories uh, in the top space, uh, and, and we can do that. Now, this is a uh, potentially very expensive way to connect these two layers, and there are much better ways, but for the purposes of what I want to say today, I'll assume this particular way of connecting those dynamics, right? That I go from continuous dynamics to a non-deterministic transition system. That non-deterministic transition system then represents the continuous dynamics, and I can now reason over them. All right, so now we've got a way of saying, what's the control problem that we want to solve? And here's a representation of that control problem. So P represents the dynamics of the process, E represents the dynamics of the environment, and C represents the dynamics of my controller. So we have a process. We can command actions of that process from our controller. Um, the output of that process is available both to our controller but also to the environment. The environment can see us. The environment can take an action. So think about cars driving around and you turn left and then somebody decides to stop or go or whatever they do. And then those can affect us, right? They can affect the process dynamics. And as I'll show you in a minute, the controller may make use of them also. Now, I like this diagram because if this was a controls uh, community, they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know how to solve this problem, All right? This is the, when I put down the, the lowest level control problem and I had these weighted sensitivity functions or weighted functions over frequency, this is actually the description we would use. This is the picture we would draw. It's, of course, the same feedback picture that I drew before with the exception that we've added this environment. And this environment represents kind of unmodeled but bounded dynamics. Right? That is, we have the dynamics of our process, they're also a little bit uncertain, but we have to take into account the fact that we interact with an environment. Now, if that environment can do anything, we're not going to be able to do very much in terms of our control synthesis, right? If I'm driving down the highway and a car five miles away can suddenly land right on top of me, you're not going to be able to design a controller that doesn't run into other cars, right? But that doesn't happen because they're bound by physics too, right? And so we know that there's some bound on their behaviors. So the way to think about this diagram is that I have some nominal description of my process dynamics. It's going to be now a discrete transition system model. It may be non-deterministic to account for the fact that I don't know it exactly. I've got some sort of description of my environment. That description might be another non-deterministic transition system, or it might be a temporal logic formula that describes the possible behaviors, right, which is roughly equivalent to that. And now the problem that I would like to solve is to define a controller, probably a finite state machine deterministic controller, such that some set of specifications, some temporal logic specification, for example, is satisfied. So that's the problem that we want to solve. And so, uh, and that's of course a classic synthesis problem, right? I'm now completely in the discrete state, discrete event domain, right? And I simply need to synthesize a finite state machine that satisfies by some formula, right? The formula is the formula describing the process dynamics, the environment dynamics, and whatever my desired behaviors are uh, for those two things. Okay, so that's really the problem that we want to solve. And the problem with solving that uh, is that it's 
complicated, right? So doubly exponentially complex in the number of specifications, right? So if I want to do reactive protocol synthesis in exactly this way, um, then uh, I uh, would have something that's doubly exponentially in the number of specifications. So if you have five specifications, two to the two to the fifth, two to the thirty-second complexity, right? But if you have ten specifications, right, two to the two to the tenth, two to the thousandth complexity, you're done, right? You're never going to solve that problem, all right? So. This, we're dead. This is why, in, in some sense, you can say, you know, why haven't we, the controls community, made use of tools from computer science before, right, uh, and these particular tools for synthesis, et cetera? Because we can't solve realistic problems, right? I mean, we have hundreds of specifications, right? Uh, and so there's just no way to solve it, even at a simplified uh, abstraction, uh, you know, very simplified higher level abstraction, we just couldn't solve any interesting problems. And, and the field of discrete event dynamical systems, right, has been working on this problem for 20 or 30 years, and I would say that they've made great progress on the theory side, but it's been very difficult to get practical tools at work because of this complexity barrier. Okay, so that changed, it changed for me specifically when I learned about a result, and that result uh, is a set of results by Pitterman, uh, Pinoelli, and Saar from 2005, so about 10 years ago now, uh, on GR1 synthesis. So GR1 is a fragment of LTL, stands for general reactivity, a general reactivity formula is roughly one that says if I have some safety and liveness conditions on the environment, that should imply some safety and liveness conditions on my system, okay, roughly. And the, the magic about GR1 synthesis is that we can cast this into a formulation in which we can use mu calculus, and mu calculus gives us some efficiency benefits, and in particular, if we make a couple of assumptions, and we have to decide whether they're reasonable, one is that we need the environment to fix its action before the controller has to act. And so I'll modify my picture a little bit and say that I can, the controller can see what the environment can do, and it's going to be a turn-based system. So specifically, the environment selects an action for what to do. The controller sees the action from the environment plus the current state of the process, makes a decision about what to do, and then implements that decision, and now the system decision and the environment decision are implemented simultaneously, and then we do another turn. And so sort of graphically, we can imagine that as the environment chooses an action, the controller sees that action, uh, and looking at what the plant is doing, decides what it's going to do, right, then the environment can take another step. Now, in the problems that we're thinking about, these sort of feedback control problems, et cetera, this is not a bad assumption if you're computing fast enough. Right? Think about it in the autonomous driving case, right? What it would say is that I go to the intersection and then the car at another point has to decide to move or not, and then I know whether it's going to move or not, right? And then I can make my decision. So suppose it isn't moving and I see that it's not moving, and so I make the decision that I'm going to go out in the intersection, and then a couple of milliseconds later, I just look again, right? I say, oh, now it's moving. Right? So as long as, in some sense, I can see the environment quickly enough and react to it quickly enough, it's not a bad assumption. It is an assumption, but it gives an enormous benefit to us because it turns out that if we can make this sort of uh, uh, game uh, in which we have uh, this kind of alternation of environment and process dynamics, and if we write a certain class of specification, namely these uh, GR1 specifications, then it turns out that the complexity of solving the problem goes from being doubly exponential in the specifications to cubic in the number of states. Now, there's a little bit of a, a, a gotcha there, because cubic in the number of states, the states could be exponential in the size of the specification in general, but it turns out that often they're not. Right? That is, that when we encode a specification as a finite state, uh, so a deterministic transition system, finite state machine, then often it's not too bad. And if you're clever about it, you can do it in a good way. Okay, so cubic in the number of states is suddenly tractable, right? That scales, right? roughly speaking. And you know, I tell controls audiences, this is like somebody telling you uh, that the hard complex optimization problem you're trying to solve is convex. Right? Or better yet, linear. It's a linear program. It's like all of a sudden you go, oh, geez, at that point I can solve big problems. All right, so we found out about these results uh, from Hadas Kreskazid, who was at Cornell, uh, who was working with George Pappas at Penn, uh, and then it's just like it clicks. It goes, oh my God, this is going to change what we're able to do because now we can compute fast enough, right, to be able to actually do something. And so I think a lot of people in the field, you know, sort of not only picked up on these results, but just sort of, you know, started saying, hey, we've got enough computational power now that we can start doing things. So that cubic complexity makes a big difference. Um, this is what the specification looks like. Um, so here we're looking at a temporal logic formula in which we say that the environment, that's the superscript E, uh, has some uh, set of properties that are true. So it has to satisfy some initial uh, conditions that say that the environment is initially positioned in some reasonable way, like you're not sitting on top of another car. Another car is not sitting on top of you, something like that. Um, it has a safety specification, so it has to satisfy some rules that it will never uh, violate. 
uh, and it has a progress specification or a liveness specification that says it will always eventually do certain things. And you'll see in examples sort of where that comes up. And under those assumptions about the environment, that should imply, so I'm going to try and design a controller such that some specifications on the system are true. And so I'll have some initial uh, specifications on what the system states can be, uh, and then some safety conditions and some liveness conditions. Right? So, so GR1 spec's a little bit more general than that, but that's basically the idea. So we have safety plus liveness of the environment implies safety plus liveness of the system. We're trying to design a controller that enforces that temporal logic for me. So that's the idea. So the synthesis now, we can use GR1 synthesizers. Uh, they are relatively efficient, um, and so we can solve reasonably sized problems. Right? Um, so we, an important part of this is that we have an environmental assumption and a system guarantee. So this is in an assumed guarantee format. Uh, and so these GR1 general reactivity formulas uh, break up nicely into this assumed uh, guarantee format. Okay, so that result in some sense and the other results that have come around it for other fragments of temporal logics uh, has enabled us to now solve interesting reactivity problems, right? So we want to synthesize a reactive protocol. Environment does something, I do something in response. Environment does something, I do something in response. Uh, and we'd like to do so in a way uh, that uh, we can implement a desired set of behaviors. Okay, so there's still a problem. And that problem is that even if it's only cubic in the number of states, the number of states could be huge. So for example, if I say, okay, I would like uh, tomorrow, absent, uh, I don't think we have snow here, so it'd be good. I would like tomorrow to get to the airport, all right? Then we can think about what's the state space of that system, right? And so we'd say, okay, no problem. Uh, I'll break up uh, some corridor of possible paths that I might drive uh, between here and the airport into 10 meter sections or something like that, right? And then I'll keep track of what might be in those 10 meter sections. Is there a car or not a car, et cetera? And I'll just plan for every contingency. Great. How many 10 meter sections are there between here and the airport? I don't know, like a thousand or something like that. Um, and uh, in those 10 meter sections, how many possible cars in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area might be in those, right? You know, hundreds, right? So I've got, you know, tens of thousands to the hundredth power states, right? Okay, that's it, we're done. We can't synthesize that, right? And the problem is I can't synthesize it because I would have to plan ahead of time in my reactive formula for every possible contingency. Right? And, and that's just too big a problem to solve all of a sudden. Right? And oh, by the way, I also have to solve for what if I get a flat tire on the way, and what if my steering controller goes out, and you know, all sorts of other things that are in my plant description, right? that non-deterministic part of the process dynamics. Okay, so we have to figure out a way to get by that problem. And there are a couple of ways to get by that. One is you can use symmetries, roughly speaking. You can say, look, you know, solving, if I'm driving on the highway, solving the problem in this 100 meter rate area, Right, of the freeway. It's just like solving the problem in that other 100 meters. So I don't need to put them, concatenate them all together, right? I can just sort of solve it in one representative area, right? Reduce the size of the, of the state space and then solve it there and then just translate that solution as I go down the road, right? So that's one way that you might do it. Um, you might have a very high layer of abstraction or you might divide it into multiple layers of abstraction, right? I'm going to have a high level go from the road to the freeway controller that doesn't worry in detail about the traffic and then I'm going to have one that's the merge onto the road part which worries more about the details of the traffic. So we can do all of these things. The way we picked to manage the complexity was to steal an idea from control theory and one that I've already mentioned, uh, and that's this notion of online optimization and receding horizon control. And so let me first tell you the kind of control theory version of this, and then I'll sort of say how this applies in the context of uh, these discrete systems. So a very standard picture for control theorists to look at is this one here. It's a little bit small. It is the picture I've already shown you, right? So you see the physical system sitting in the middle. Uh, you see the system uncertainty, right? That was my E block before, sitting at the bottom, and then uh, at the top. And then at the bottom, you see my controller, right? So this, I just re, you know, sort of uh, organized the blocks a little bit. But that right-hand side of the diagram is exactly the one that I showed you before. Now, one of the things that control has recognized, and you saw it in the abstraction hierarchy, is that you often don't solve the problem just in that feedback reactive way, but you also add planning in, right? So I'm gonna plan a nominal route from here to the airport, and I'm gonna put a feedback controller to maintain that route. And so this trajectory generation block that you see on the left is that I have some reference, some input that comes in, some description of the problem, get from here to the airport, right? The trajectory generation then goes and solves that problem. Um, and gives me a nominal set of trajectories. That nominal set of trajectories consists of two things, the blocks that you see coming out. One is, here is the desired trajectory and state space that I want you to follow, where I want you to be on the road, et cetera, et cetera. And the other, the top one, is the nominal input required to do it. So that nominal input is called a feed forward term. We know that we're gonna have to speed up, so we may as well pre-compute, right, how much do I have to press the gas pedal, so that I don't, if I don't 
feed forward that information, right? Then I'll say, oh, you should be going 55 miles an hour, and I'm not telling you anything about, you know, nominally how much you should pressure gas. So the feedback controller will pick it up, right? It will say, oh, wait a minute, you want me to go be going 55, I'm only going 20, I need to push the gas harder. But you get better performance, right? If I tell you, you know, if you push the gas about this much, you know, go uh, closer to the right speed. Now, of course, when you do that, how much you press the gas, which car you're in, how old your car is changes, right? So you still need the feedback controller to regulate that, right? So you can't get away with it. But this is like the standard design pattern for control systems, right? You get a, a trajectory generation piece and then a feedback controller that kind of counts, accounts for the rest of the uncertainty. The trajectory generation is done on a nominal model that's pretty accurate. Now, the thing that people recognized as computing got to be a lot faster was that there's no reason that you just compute the trajectory once. You may as well recompute the trajectory based on the system state, right? And so if I start driving down the road and for whatever reason, my controller's not that good or you know, something changes, I don't actually end up uh, in the position that I want to be or something like that, why don't I recompute from there what my trajectory ought to be? Right? Of course, we all do this with Google Maps all the time, right? You, know, you sort of make a wrong turn, or you decide not to follow the directions and it recomputes. Right? Now we want to do this just you know, at the level of the physical dynamics and other things and at a faster time scale. So this notion that you might do that, right, leads to the online optimization because now I have to read what the system state is now, dynamically, and do my computation now, dynamically, not ahead of time, right, but while I'm actually driving. Now, there are lots of advantages to doing that. One is that in addition to looking at the system state, you can also look at what the environment is. In other words, I don't need to just design, uh, just look at what my system is. I can look around and see where are the other cars, right? At least in the neighborhood around me. What is the traffic look like? And again, Google Maps is a good analogy. This is doing exactly this problem, right? Because it's looking at what the traffic is and rerouting you and other things based on what the traffic around you is. And so this design pattern where we now add another feedback loop, there are now two, right? There's an inner loop, what typically would get called the inner loop, um, that is the regulatory loop that's running very fast. And there's an outer loop and that outer loop is running more slowly and doing an online computation. And the way that we organize this is to do the outer computation, not for all time, like Google Maps does, but in a control setting for a finite horizon. And so the problem we solve is, mathematically you can see it as the equation just under the graph, is exactly right this uh, cost function that I put down. We want to calculate the input, which minimizes the integral cost plus some terminal cost over a finite horizon. So time capital T is the finite horizon. And then we want to do that subject to the dynamics of the system and the constraints that are active on the system right, and all of those other things. And so in the graph, what you see is that I might calculate out that cost function over a time capital T and implement that. And you get the red curve that you see on the bottom as you implement that. Um, so that's the calculated curve. That's what I expect to do. You see the, the red curve, the first red curve goes out to time capital T. Now, when I implement that, when I apply those inputs, I may not get exactly that. I might follow the blue curve instead. I've got uncertainty, right? My model may not be exactly right, et cetera. So after a short time delta t, I look and see where I am, and I recompute from there what to do. And so you get another red curve now going out time t, so slightly further. And then I recompute, right? I go for delta t, and I recompute further. And so eventually you follow this blue curve, even though each of those little red curves is sort of what your uh, trajectory generation told you to do. And if you design it right, and this is important, right, you actually have to be careful about doing this. And you have to be careful because the time horizon matters, right? If you choose a very short time horizon, you will make decisions on that short time horizon that screw you up in the future, right? If I choose a very long time horizon, I can capture the future well, but the problem now is that that future uh, calculation is very expensive. Right? So I could compute all the way from here to the airport, but I've got to compute about all the possible traffic conditions. I can compute from here to me stepping off this podium. Right? That's no problem, but it probably doesn't give me much information about you know, what I should do. Right? Or I start going down that row. If I don't look to see that the row's blocked off, right? obviously I did the wrong thing. So I have to have a long enough horizon, but not too long. And for stability purposes, remember underlying, we never want to design something that's not uh, that have good stability properties, we actually have to tune the cost function. So this cost function, the integral of L plus V, actually has some properties to it. And if those properties are not satisfied, you cannot guarantee that this will be stable. But if they are, you know that it's going to be stable when you do this iteration. So this area is called model predictive control or receding horizon control in the controls community. Um, it first was used in chemical process control plants, been used there for 20 or 30 years. Why? Chemical process control plants are slow. The dynamics are slow. You're heating up and cooling down big volumes of chemicals and other things. And so compute time is not limited. It's now applied in jet aircraft, jet engines, all sorts of other applications. Why? Computing's fast. Right? We can compute enough in that period of time. 
All right, so the idea of receding horizon control is a little bit maybe um, uh, contradictory in the sense that we have a hard optimization problem and we make it simpler by putting it online. So we go from an offline design problem, right, figure out all possible things that could happen and design uh, reactions to do them, to an online computation problem. And uh, we uh, do that in a way in which I now specify the desired dynamics and then online I choose my actions across some optimization with constraints so that I'll satisfy that. And it's surprising because it's actually simpler. And it's simpler because of essentially two things, maybe three things. One is we only need to compute the optimization over a short period, not a long period. Right? So that simplifies the computation. A second is we don't need to compute from any possible system state what to do. We only need to compute from our current system state what to do, right? Because we know where we are, right? And so we can do that. And the third is we don't need to compute for every possible environmental actions, but only those that are consistent with what we can see around us. So if we have good sensing, right, and we can see all the cars around us on the road, right, we have some a priori knowledge about the set of behaviors that they can do over that finite horizon based on our current state, and that simplifies the problem. And so while we can't solve this offline control problem, we can sometimes solve this online control problem. Okay, so let's go back then uh, to our discrete transition system example. Right? I said that if I wanted to have a discrete transition system representation from here to the airport, that's too big, uh, but maybe we can do something different. And so what we can do is to essentially do receding horizon temporal logic planning. Uh, and so uh, the idea is that we have a specification, and so this specification that I've written here, uh, this is a type of GR1 specification. Here I've written a slightly simpler one. So we have that some initial conditions are satisfied and the environment always satisfies some rules. No liveness conditions on this one, but you can put all of those in, it's not a problem. Um, and that should imply that some safety conditions are satisfied. And here I've just said that I should get to some goal eventually. Right? So that formula says that uh, if the initial conditions of the system are satisfied and the environment always, so always phi m, phi m's a formula that describes environmental behaviors, that should imply that always phi s, some safety condition, uh, and eventually phi g, I get to some goal state, right, defined by some uh, proposition. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, formula that is in GR1 form, and so we can solve it in roughly cubic complexity in the number of states, and then the number of clauses and other things are the n and m in there. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we just go through the, the, the kind of problem that I told you. That is, we first just discretize the state, so break up our state space into some discrete state abstraction. We had continuous dynamics to start with. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna organize the regions, the, the individual states, into larger regions. This is to simplify the problem a little bit. So we're gonna aggregate, all right, you know, all of those 10 meter by 10 meter uh, regions into this say, uh, one mile section of the highway, the next one mile section of the highway, right? At the intersection, we might break that up into several smaller regions, right? We can do whatever we want. So we're gonna aggregate these, and I'm gonna call those script Ws. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to change the problem specification. And we're gonna change the problem specification in the following way. I'm going to solve the problem of, given that specification down there. So starting in region Wi, and forget the fee for a second, Assuming that the environment satisfies its uh, dynamics or behaviors, I want to always satisfy my safety conditions and not get to the goal, but rather get to some place closer to the goal. And so, in fact, we're going to need a partial order on these Ws. I'm going to need to be able to tell you, right, that the, some Ws are closer to the goal than other Ws. Right? And so in doing so, I create a partial order, and now I have an optimization on this partial order, or not an optimization, but a, a, a satisfaction problem on this partial order, right? Starting in one region, I want to get to a region that's closer to the goal. Now, you see in this formula, right, I replaced phi init with starting in this region, um, and then I added on, uh, I replaced eventually phi g uh, with uh, eventually get closer. Right? So that's like doing a finite horizon optimization instead of doing a infinite horizon optimization. But in all the uh, finite horizon optimizations, I've added this terminal cost. That turns out to be very important for getting stability. And there's an addition here as well. And that addition is this invariant fee. So this fee, you'll see, is something that I'm going to have to impose additionally. And what I'm going to say is that if fee is true at the beginning of my execution trace, I should maintain fee at all times. And so this is one of the ways in which we get the additional conditions that are required to make sure that we converge. We have to add this invariant. And a limitation of this theory right now is that that invariant is made up by hand, 
right? So we can tell whether or not we've got the right one by whether or not we can solve the problem, right? But then if we don't have the right one, right now a human has to go and reason about that. We've got some ways about how to automate that. By the way, that'd be a great area if anybody's interested, right? How do you generate the invariance that we need for this particular thing? So we basically add on this invariant fee. And as I already mentioned, uh, we have uh, changed these uh, sort of conditions. And if you do that, then essentially what happens is you now need to execute a relatively small uh, synthesis problem, right? Because I just need to get from one region to a closer region. Uh, and that small synthesis problem I can do online. And so we actually generate this online. Uh, and we essentially, when we move to the next region, so if I move from WI to WJ, I resolve the problem starting at WJ. When I move from WJ to WK, I resolve the problem starting at WK, and we just keep going. And this particular formulation, uh, in fact, guarantees that this satisfies the specification up at the top. So this is the way we manage the complexity. We take what was an infinite time problem and we break it down uh, into these finite ones. Okay, so let me end just with an example of how all of that works to give you some flavor for it. So I'll do an autonomous uh, vehicle example. We do lots of different ones. So the system is this sort of system that I described. We have a set of traffic rules. These are the specifications that we need to satisfy, right? So I put them up here at the top, right? So I put three of them up at the top. Not allowed to collide with other vehicles. You need to stay in your lane unless there's an obstacle blocking your lane, and you can only proceed through an intersection if it's clear. We also need a bunch of environmental assumptions. And so just as an example, uh, if we look at this particular uh, specification, right? Stay in your travel lane unless there's an obstacle blocking the lane. Um, if you just try and synthesize with that, you will immediately get a counterexample. That is, your synthesizer will come back and say, this specification is not satisfiable. And it's not satisfiable because we need another assumption. And that assumption is sort of hidden down here. Right? That assumption says that an obstacle should not disappear when a vehicle is in its vicinity. Right? Why do we need that? Because suppose I'm driving up and I see a car, right? and I move to the side and I get out of the lane, and then this car disappears, just magically disappears. I'm now not in my travel rain, lane for no good reason. There's nobody in the lane next to me. All right? Why didn't I get back in? But of course, the car can't just disappear. If it was there, it was there. But if you don't tell, of course, right, the, that description right, to the synthesizer, right, it assumes the car can disappear because you didn't bound that behavior. Right? So we need to do that. So as is often the case, you spend a lot of time now writing specifications right, instead of writing controllers uh, and you know, trying it and then saying, oh, it doesn't work, and adding another one in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, similarly, only proceed through the intersection when it's clear requires an environmental assumption, and that environmental assumption is that intersections are clear infinitely often. If somebody sits in an intersection forever and I can't go into the intersection because I can't run into them and violate another spec, I'm not going to be able to make it through an intersection. Right? Okay, so you can get the flavor of these sorts of things, but all of this fits in a GR1 specification, and so we can actually synthesize this. And so what I'm going to show you here is just an animation of a synthesized controller. Uh, and in this synthesized controller, what we did is we solved it as a receding horizon problem. Um, we used a tool called TULIP that I'll mention maybe briefly at the end. Uh, and TULIP was able to solve this problem, return a 900 state finite state machine over the horizon it was looking at in about 1.5 seconds. Right? On a laptop, right? not a lot of optimization, right? all sorts of other things. So that's what I mean by relatively quick. Right? We're in 1.5 seconds able to solve for a controller. You implement that for a second, solve another one. If you, well, okay, you've got to get it up to less than one second. Right? So if you can solve it in less than a second, implement it for a second, resolve it, right? implement it for a second, resolve it, resolve it, resolve it, resolve it. Resolve it. So that's the idea. Okay, so what does this look like? So we go driving down the road, we see an obstacle, we drive down. The red blobs are uh, obstacles. Once we pass them, we don't see them anymore, but we assume they're there. The intersection is blocked. It must eventually clear. That was an assumption. When it clears, we move through the intersection. The goal here is to go around that bottom circle. So think of it like a bus route. We want to go around this circle multiple times. We see an obstacle. We come back up. Uh, we now come up to this intersection. That was our second bus stop. We go back around. We're going back to the first bus stop. It's on the right-hand side. All of a sudden, the road's blocked. Now, this actually violates an assumption. All right, if you go back and look at the previous chart, you'll see that one of the assumptions is the entire road should never be blocked. So now what do we do? Well, one thing is we're not sitting alone, right? There's another layer of the abstraction hierarchy that's sitting above this, right? And that other layer can say, under certain conditions, we can relax the rules, right? If the road's entirely blocked, right? You know, there's a bunch of cars and they're completely blocking it, you're allowed to make a U-turn in the middle of the street, right? Not usually done. So what do we do? We pop up to one higher layer of abstraction, right? So we go at this traffic planner level and we say, hey, person above me, the mission planner, I can't actually satisfy the specification. What do you want me to do? Give up, right, or change the rules? Mission planner says, change the rules. Okay, great, change the rules. I'll turn around in the middle of the street, come back around. Now I'll turn right, right, go up this way. There was nobody at that intersection. I go through the intersection. I go around the obstacle. I come back down, et cetera. 
So all of this, I mean, it's a simulation, but all of this is being solved, right, with this receding horizon controller and in this abstraction hierarchy. And the hierarchy in the right has all the other layers, too. Those are all running, right? So we're actually following real trajectories, right? You can sort of see some dynamics to this stuff, right? You know, there's noise, right? You can see the trajectories aren't all exactly straight all the time, right? So all of those things. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we're able to do. Um, we've implemented, as a kind of reference uh, model for these uh, sorts of calculations, uh, uh, something called Tulip, the Temporal Planning Toolbox. Uh, it's on GitHub, and you can uh, sort of go to tulipcontrol.org and, and get all the links to it. Uh, and it essentially uh, is an implementation of the types of ideas they've been talking to you about. It takes a system model as a set of piecewise linear differential equations. Uh, it takes a system specification as some sort of uh, GR1 formula. More generally, we're working on STL formulas rather than LTL formulas and other things. Not all of that's done. And it takes some sort of an environmental specification, either as a discrete transition, non-deterministic discrete transition system, or as a temporal logic formula that describes the behaviors. And then it does all of the things I said. It creates a discrete abstraction that's consistent with the specifications. Uh, it goes and it solves for what the control, the continuous controller is, the red thing on the upper right, has to solve for how do I move from one region to another region, so I have to solve for that controller, but then it also gives you the supervisory controller, the discrete transition part of this, the discrete control part of this that says when do you go into an intersection, when do you move forward, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, last chart just to kind of summarize a little bit and say uh, some of the future directions. So I've told you a little bit about uh, how to do uh, synthesis for networked uh, control of hybrid systems. I haven't talked a lot about the network part, uh, but more the hybrid part. Um, I think this absolutely requires an integration of ideas from control, computer science, networking, uh, and various other uh, disciplines, so it's a great area of overlap. Um, I, I want to point out, because I think it's important, that robustness really drives the controls field, and I think it needs to drive everything that everybody's doing these days, right? Getting something to work, right, in exactly the right conditions is much easier than getting it to work when there are uncertainties. How do you describe those uncertainties? How do you bound these uncertainties? How do you reason about those? Uh, is something I think where control theory has some nice tools and principles, right, where the, the principles might apply more broadly. Um, there are, uh, and so this, you know, kind of picture uh, is one that sort of captures that. There are lots and lots of open problems. So how do we decompose the specifications, for example, if I have multiple subsystems? How do I decompose them vertically? What are the right uh, abstraction layers in an arbitrary problem, right? I pick them in, in these motion control problems. We have a pretty good sense, at least, of what people tend to do. And so we're consistent with that. Uh, but if I give you an electric power system on an aircraft, it may not be clear what the abstraction layers are. And that's a distributed system because you have a left engine and a right engine. You have controllers running on all those things. So how do I divide my control uh, horizontally, if you want, uh, in a given layer across that? And a big one is that you know, we're limited to these GR1 specifications in LTL in terms of the specific synthesis tools that we have. We have other things that work for LTL in this receding horizon, or uh, STL, sorry, signal temporal logic in this receding horizon context. So I think there are ideas there, but lots more work that's needed. And we need lots of help from some of the really smart people in the audience to do that. So, okay, so I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. your thoughts on the role of feedback for writing software. Yeah, so... Uh, receding uh, software, perhaps. Yes, right, so so it's a great question. So, you know, I think um, the notion of using feedback, uh, you know, okay, so I'm a controls guy, right? So feedback sort of, you know, near and dear to my heart, right? And, and I think every system in which you have to worry about managing uncertainty or design of dynamics, right, uh, can benefit from feedback. So for example, in software, there's no reason why you can't call a function and then check to see whether that function did the right thing. And if it didn't do the right thing, maybe either call a different function or call the function with slightly different arguments, right? So think about an algorithm that's a feedback algorithm. So uh, a long time ago, and you can ask me about it if you're interested, we thought about how would you do sorting with feedback, for example, right? Suppose I gave you a function that, I gave you several functions and each of them kind of sorted a little bit, but you had to decide, you know, I'm gonna feed you an input stream, I'm gonna do an output stream that's slightly better sorted than the others, but I wanna sort as quickly as possible. Well, that might depend on what the input stream is, right? Well, you could use feedback to decide which sorter to use or what combination of sorters to use, right? So we could design these feedback algorithms that do that. So I think there are lots of possible applications. Again, I would say, think about where's your uncertainty. Here the uncertainty was, I don't know what the input sequence is and I might get different performance for different types of sorting algorithms, right? I'm gonna manage that uncertainty by putting some feedback, seeing which ones do a better job sorting, and then using that to decide how much CPU time do I spend on one sorter versus another sorter. How would we cast that as a feedback problem, I think is an interesting problem to think about. So I think it is a good area. 
So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I especially enjoyed the final example. So, two questions about that. Uh, first, uh, can you just give a bit more detail? What is that additional invariant that you had on the slide before that in that example? And secondly, you mentioned how uh, when the, the whole road is blocked, you have to uh, re forget about some rules. But how do you decide which rules to forget? Like, don't crash into other vehicles still, but U turns are now okay. Great. So just in terms of what the actual invariant was, uh, in that case what the invariant was uh, was uh, something that said that if there's no, uh, there are several pieces to it, but just an example, was that if there are no obstacles in the next couple of blocks in front of you, then you should end your trajectory pointing straight. All right? Why? Because if you ended it pointing sideways, that satisfied the short-term spec. Right? But at the next step after that, right, you pop out right, for no reason. Right? So it was things like that. Right? And of course, that wouldn't have come up if I'd done over a longer horizon, right? but the short horizon forced me to say that. Right? And of course, now that only holds if there's nothing in front of you, because obviously there is something in front of you, you're going around it, right? so you're going to point out. So that was the sort of invariant that got added on. And as I said, unfortunately, it was a very ad hoc process. Right? You try and synthesize. Synthesizer comes back and says, doesn't work. Here's a counterexample. You look at the counterexample, oh, yeah, of course. Right? I mean, here's what it's doing. So, and we think we might be able to automate that, right? So do some sort of counterexample guided refinement or something, right? But we haven't worked that out yet. So uh, that was one. Um, you know, this, the, uh, sorry, I figured out the second question. How do you decide which rule to oh, violate yeah. now? Right, so uh, that's another one. Um, so actually one of my uh, former postdocs, Vasu Raman, on the job market by the way, uh, is uh, thought about some of this in her PhD work, which is suppose I give you a, a specification and that specification is violated, what you'd like to know is what are the parts of the specification that are causing a problem that I might remove. So that's problem one, is just how do we even identify? The spec is wrong, right? There's something in the spec, right? Here's a specific execution trace, but there may be multiple parts that got violated by that execution. Which one should I remove? So right now, I have to say, we do this with our intuition about the problem, right? Uh, and so that higher level mission management in this diagram that's over here is itself, unfortunately, not formally synthesized, but ad hoc synthesized. Now, one thing we know is we will only pass down specifications. Whatever we do there, we'll only solve things. So the, the, the danger is if, if you as a human reason that I'm only going to give you specifications that are uh, logical, the problem may be that I can't solve it, right? So I, I sort of relax. I say, you can turn around in the middle of the road and it says, sorry, I, that doesn't solve my problem, right? I can't actually synthesize. So again, I think that's an area for more research. I, this is part of how do we break up that hierarchy? How do we be formal at every level? So great questions. Richard, thanks. Um, I should tell you that every large software project knows what receding horizon means in yes. terms of producing the software. Uh, but more seriously, uh, you talked about these of algorithmic questions in synthesizing the controller. There's a dual aspect of developing the software stack. And I imagine that most of the software here is C or C++. And I was wondering whether you have any, uh, any thoughts on what kind of language abstractions would let you implement these things in a better way without bugs and so on? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. So I mean, I think certainly uh, just if you look at what uh, control theory does and the language abstractions we use there, uh, they are very different language abstractions, right? I mean, we write down cost functions, but then we would say, okay, I want an algorithm that implements a certain input-output response, right? And then my description of the algorithm would be the input-output response, right? Then I would simply autocode that, right, into something. So it'd be nice to think about, and I don't know the answer. It's a great question. You know, what are, if I had to say, here's a language for feedback software, to come back to Ross's question, right? What would I put in there? I would want, you know, some sort of a language that had some notion that a return of a function might not return the right thing, and that I could calculate, that I had some metric, right, on how far the answer was from what I wanted, so I have some, I need, to, I need to impose a metric and some notion of calculating that metric, right, what would that metric be? So, I don't know, it's a good question. So, you know, you guys are all programming language guys, come up and talk to me and tell me, here's how I think I would do it, and I'll at least react to it, right? I, not enough of a programming language person to know what I want. We, we like to program in specifications. So, another thing you can think about is just, you know, what about a contract synthesis language, right? You know, how could I write something in which I write down the contract, I then apply some operations to that to distribute that contract, right? What would that language look like, right, in terms of the algorithm they implement? We use, for example, a lot of mu calculus, right, a language for implementing mu calculus, which has these bizarre fixed point operators and other things, would be a natural um, atomic element within a language, perhaps, right? So I would just say solve for this fixed point, right, as an as a, as a atomic uh, calculation. So I think my question has already been partly answered by you in some of the previous answers. 
but uh, uh, the essential focus is on what happens when the environment assumptions are not met. And uh, what you suggested is that we move up to a higher abstraction where there is some environment assumption that is met. So the system uh, behavior, expected system behavior is specified at some uh, level of abstraction. So some of us have started looking into notions of robustness where we say, um, is there a way to quantitatively specify uh, how the system behavior should degrade when the environment assumptions are not met? So is, I just wanted to check if this sounds like a reasonable Yeah, it sounds direction. great. Let me, I'll give you just a couple of examples of things. So you know, certainly one thing you could imagine doing is yeah, defining some notion of degradation right, in your problem description. Uh, another you could do would be do probabilistic things. right? So I might say, look, I can't satisfy it, but if I put a probabilistic model together, can I maximize the probability that I satisfy it? And maximize mean you know, only 10%, but I do the best that I can. Right? So that'd be another way of thinking about uh, moving away from just can't satisfy it to at least doing something. Uh, I'll give you a little anecdote. So. As I mentioned a couple of times, uh, I do some uh, work where the application area is electric power systems for aircraft. So just to give you some sense, electric power systems for aircraft is a flight critical software right, that controls if an engine goes out or a generator goes out, how do I switch the power to another power source in order to make sure the flight control computers and the air conditioning system, if I have enough power, and the de-icers on the wings that we're all going to be using in the next couple of days, uh, all do what they're supposed to do. So the, the, the specification for reliability on flight critical flight software is no more than one critical failure in every 10 to the ninth flight hours. So critical failure is one that might lead to loss of life. 10 to the ninth flight hours is 100,000 years. All right? So your software should have no more than one failure every 100,000 years. So not about your software, my software is not that good. All right? So what they do, of course, is they put probabilities on everything, right? They say, okay, you know, what we need to do is we need to say, look, uh, you have to look at the probability that an engine goes out, right? And that might be, you know, one in every 10 to the fourth hours you could lose an engine, right? So now if I have two engines, right, then that's one in every 10 to the eighth hours, roughly speaking, right, that I might lose both engines. And now that's not good enough. I need 10 to the ninth. So I'll put batteries or some other uh, thing. So I asked one of the engineers once, right, I said, okay, so all of their programming assumes that, for example, there's at least one power source available or one of the power sources that can power up things. What happens if those assumptions are violated? And they go, I don't know, all right? Guess the plane falls out of the sky. <laughs> like, Great, all right? Part of the problem is that if they ask the question as engineers, then they have to answer it to the certification authorities, right? So all they're required to prove is, right, that if the assumptions are okay, the system will do the right thing. And the way they handle it is to make sure that their assumptions capture, right, all of the different things. So that's another place where they don't relax the assumption. They say if the assumption's not satisfied, we're just not gonna deal with it. And then they make the assumption really good, right? One in every 100,000 years. By the way, if you look, uh, airplanes flying in the United States fly about 100,000 hours. Uh, sorry, 10 to the ninth hours, 100,000 years worth of flight every two or three years. Uh, and indeed, every two or three years, we see a critical failure. So we're pretty close to that limit just based on experience, right? And it'd be nice if it was better, right? So that we didn't get loss of life, right? As we saw in various things over the past couple of years around the world, right? Not sure it was the flight control system or software system that was the problem, but so that's a little bit of a partial answer at least. So uh, this is Zhong Xiao from Yale University. So my question was, uh, uh, you mentioned that some of these, uh, uh, you know, like cars have a multi-core machines. And so when you synthesize these C, C++ code, are they actually running on these uh, multi-core machines? Do they have some concurrency? What, is there any, you know, uh, assumption you make about the underlying OS? And how do you deal with those kind of uh, uh, correctness issues? Yeah, it's a great question. So, the, the, you know, what we do is that um, we, uh, as is probably most common, uh, make some assumptions about the computing environment that are not necessarily true, and then uh, verify afterwards that things work. So, for example, we'll typically assume that everything's done either in a synchronous way or a tightly controlled way, and then we might go back and, say, with a verification tool, verify that what we synthesized under that assumption still works when that assumption is relaxed, and if not, we might have to go and change it, right? So, what we did in the specific case uh, of the DARPA Grand Challenge vehicle that we built 10 years ago is it was all running on Linux, no real operating system running whatsoever. It was just on Gen 2 Linux. Um, and I have to say, again, I would argue because it was a feedback system, it was pretty robust, right? So we, count, we went in and said, you know, what happens if a processor fails? What happens if a message doesn't arrive, right? And then react to those events, right? And those events might be slow down and pull over to the side of the road, right? Uh, until, right, the computer comes back up and you do something. We did online reboots, et cetera. But all of that was ad hoc. 
right? The assumptions, and we weren't doing any synthesis at the time, but now the assumptions we make would be that, let's say, the underlying computing environment has some nice properties, right? Like, you know, it always computes what you want within a certain amount of time. You can put all of that in to the synthesis tool, but now it becomes a big problem again, right? So again, you have to, I think, separate it out in layers and make some assumptions about the lower layer. And again, you can then say, oh, those assumptions were violated and go into some contingency plan at a higher layer, right? You know, I, my network seems to not be satisfying the minimum specs that are required. What do you want me to do, right? And the answer might be stop, slow down, reboot, right? And then see if it satisfies and if it doesn't, put the check engine light on or check computer's light on uh, and uh, check network uh, and then, you know, do that. Thanks. Yep. Tom Reps, <coughs> Tom Reps, University of Wisconsin. I, I interpreted your synthesis problem as being uh, to take a formula that accepted a certain language of traces and produce an automaton that accepted exactly the same language. Is there a role for similar uh, synthesis uh, operations, say refinement that would produce a subset of the set of traces or abstraction that would produce a superset of the set of traces? And, and are those problems known to be solvable? Uh, so I can't answer the last part of the question, which is, are they solvable? That's probably somebody who knows more about, you know, sort of refinement and abstraction in these sort of formal languages. Um, what I tell you is this, that in, uh, so in control theory, uh, there is also this notion of system approximation, right? Uh, and so you want to say, okay, well, I want a, a simplified representation of my system. And so, for example, what you might do, just in my diagram, is you might say, I'm going to choose a simplified model of my process dynamics that's easier to compute over, but since I know it's not very accurate, I'm going to increase the size of the environmental dynamics, right, to account for that, right? And so now I can trade, right? I can say, okay, I used a simplified model, like typically in controls, we'd say I'm going to take a linearization around an operating point, but now I'm going to increase the size of the disturbances, so they're not just the disturbances that I would see from the external environment, but also the disturbances from my approximation. And because feedback systems tend to give you robustness with respect to those uncertainties, that turns out to work pretty well. So it turns out you can get controllers that are more robust than you need in some sense, right? And so if I give you a simplified uh, controller description that I can compute on, I might be able to get a big enough ball of uncertainties that I can be robust with respect to that it captures the kind of ball of uncertainties that you did. So that's one way that control theorists have thought about doing. I absolutely, no question, even the problems we're solving are too big, right? So I, you know, I gave you a simple example, but in many cases we go and we can't simplify it enough to solve it either online or offline, and so we need some sort of an abstraction that, well, we need to break it up right, probably, and so we need an abstraction and maybe a refinement, right, in the right ways that I can solve in simplified ways. So break this problem into two, solve each one independently, put the solution back together, all of those types of ideas. Great stuff to work on. Thank need you. help. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Great, thank you very much.